Very good. Okay, well, let's ask a few questions and let's talk some bees. And our first question is kind of a conglomerate from several people because a lot of people have this kind of question this time of year. When should I start feeding bees? And should I be feeding two to one syrup or one to one syrup? Many are choosing one to one because they think that right now they should be stimulating brood rearing so that they have large clusters of bees going into winter. And yes, that is a good um, logic. But so the first part of this question comes up as, should I be feeding my bees right now? And Robert, let's just start off with you. What do you think? Um, in my situation, my answer would be no. Why would you say that? Well, all my hives look good. There's no reason uh, for me to be feeding them. I didn't, I didn't take too much honey. <clears throat> um, their populations look good. And my position is they have until now, until frost, to try to make what they would naturally want to do. And unless frost is tomorrow, which it could be, no, it, <laughs> it's, it's not going to be tomorrow. But, you know, you, you've got, you do have some time. But you have removed your supers. And so right now your bees are using this fall forage time to just stuff those hives. Exactly. Full. So that is, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm, I, my view is to remove the supers. This is the time to do it, Labor Day weekend traditionally. <clears throat> Get your honey off and you, you condense the bees into your two brood boxes that, and the bees will naturally push the brood nest down into the lower box while they fill up the rest of the brood, uh, upper brood box with nectar, honey, whatever they're making. So, Anybody else want to add to that? Or is there, what is the circumstance that would say, in, in everything in beekeeping, there's a, except for this. So what is the exception to that rule? I agree with Robert that if your hives are in good shape, right now is the time they're stuffing those boxes full, probably don't need full, fed. But why would you feed them right now? What do you think, Chris? Your picture's up here on my screen, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna yell at you. Um. <laughs> Were you sleeping again? <laughs> no, you and Judy are stumping me lately. Oh, no, no, no. So why would you feed now? What, 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 um, you'd feed now if there weren't enough stores, if, they, if your top yeah. box didn't have honey in it. And I would feed a two, two part sugar, two part, one part water ratio because you want them to store it. Yeah, and not have to do a lot of evaporation. That you, you want them socking that away. I think you'd see this if it was one of those late swarms that you were trying to go, okay, I've got to get this. I want to try to limp this hive along and get it to make it through the winter. I think that's when you might see that. So that's that no, would I be didn't. my thought when if somebody is feeding right now but you have to get in the hive you have to know what's happening in your hive to be able to make those kinds of decisions hey, Becky, so yeah i'm going to interject something here i'm out here in western kansas oh normally by this time of the year things are really dry and we yeah. don't have much going on yeah this year we've had moisture we still have plants blooming so I still got a lot of flowers and different kinds of plants out in my fields that are blooming. Sure. The asters, the CRP. Some of the CRP got cut this year and it had alfalfa in it. So this, the regrowth on the alfalfa and those that were just cut here recently is now blooming. So they still have stuff that they can put up. <clears throat> That's a good, good point. So not only the condition of your hive, but what you have environmentally for the bees. That's to interesting. Yeah. We started feeding one year in, um, it was like the first of August. Somebody asked, was, when do you start feeding your bees? Because the there sugar was water and nothing. stuff. And everybody's saying, well, you don't need to do it if your bees are in good shape and stuff. And I'm glad we got in there and looked at it because they said, Labor Day is the day you're supposed to get in and look at your hives. Really? Yeah, we just happened to do it today. Yeah, I'm Who's sorry. Talking? So, 
You got your microphone turned off, right? Yeah. Well, they I'm sorry. Muted everybody. Uh, yeah. Our, yes. Okay. Well, it's good. Yeah. Good, good points to bring on. So here is the next part of that question. Someone wrote, they said, we noticed that our bees are eating the honey they stored earlier this summer. Is that a concern? What do you think, Steve M? What was the question again? I'm sorry. They said, we noticed that bees are eating the honey they stored earlier this summer. And is that a concern? No, that's, that's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what bees do. Um, they you know, put it in. That goes along with let go, you know. That's what they eat. That's um, that goes along with going in your hive and know what's going on. Do they have enough stores? And then later on, if if you don't think they got enough stores, then feed them. It, it it's it's never going to hurt to feed them. I don't think. <clears throat> um, but again, it's um. um yeah, they, and a lot of times, and and I've heard I I saw a little bit of it this year, where bees were pulling some of the honey down out of the supers to put in their hive bodies. So there was a little bit of that going on before we pulled ours. They'll move it around as they need yeah. it. So yeah, that's, that's so, part yeah, of Yeah, that's what they do. That's that's why they store it. I know in years past, we would see them have a full super and then go out couple of weeks of drought and it's like oh they ate it well they made it they get the first dibs so if they need it that's that's it and i think that's a, a good use of it so a lot of times they move it down to the bo bottom supers too i mean the bottom yes. boxes yes. they they take and it and if they're eating their stores there's probably in that area that they're at there's probably a shortage of the fall right. flower sources um, so that could be that could be their issue is why they're seeing them eating so much instead of bringing it in. So this next one, I Chad, I'm back, can we back up to the first one? Sure. The first part because we had a, went to a youth scholarship student yesterday, and they had a hive other than their scholarship hive that only had one deep that was drawn out, and it was actually in an eight frame. And they had the bees had not ever moved up into the second box, and so, you know, we told them they should be feeding two to one and feed that one now. So, and that would be an instance where you would sure. definitely want to start feeding now and getting them ready for winter. So, Noah, do you feel like that hive was struggling for some other reason than maybe it was started late? Do you, is there something else going on there? Or is it just it, a, a it was a hive? really small swarm when they got it and really I'm, I'm I mean it looked really good for what it was, you know. I mean it yeah. I think it really has a good chance of making it through the winter as a single. So And that's that's what good. you have to, to look at. That's Yeah, that's they'll just need to feed it all winter. Check Very on it. Likely. Yes. So well, the time to feed bees is now. Once it gets cold, you really can't feed liquid. You know, you mm -hmm. could do mm -hmm. something else. But once it gets cold, Don't they wait. they won't take it. So and they certainly won't yeah. store it. So well, um. Jolie, that's kind of our next question. It said, "It's what feed should I be using?" And tagging on to that, someone else asked. Do you advise feeding some dry sugar now to try to build up stores? I don't advise ever feeding dry sugar. So Thank maybe you. someone else ought to answer that question. No, that's the reason I asked you, Joe. <laughs> no, I don't either. Uh, yeah. you, the candy's all right, but not the dry sugar. You know, when we have, have seen dry sugar being fed too many times, we see the bees acting like it's... Um, trash and they just kind of like are carrying it out of the hive and and moving it on out so so certainly not now perhaps as an emergency feed we'll talk about some solid feed later but but definitely not now now should be the two to one syrup and jolie to tag on that what is your favorite style of feeder for winter our favorite style is the top for the fall you know, to get them through the fall. Yeah. 
Um, if you try and use entrance feeders right now, you could get robbing started. And I, I just keep seeing on Facebook, all these people putting frames out for the bees to rob or putting feed right next to the hive or even in their yard for the bees to rob. And honestly, you can just, you can lose a hive, you know, yep. bees can, bees will start robbing it and. You can lose and, it in two days. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you have any nukes, you could lose those because they'll pick on the small ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. They will. So it, yeah. Let's let's talk about some other feeders as far as your choice. The the internal hive top feeder. Um, the drawbacks, as far as I'm concerned, is that it's it they can be a little unwieldy. But this time of year, when you've started that fall feeding, you're probably not going to be getting into doing a full hive inspection a whole lot. So it's really just pop the lid, add some more feed to them. Anybody have another style of feeder that they really like for fall feeding? I, I use the regular quart jar. I put an empty hive box over the top. But you use it internally. I use it internally, yes. Yeah. Not at, yeah. externally, there's no way because that Not encourages again. robbing. That's, that's exactly, we like those real well and you can control the flow. You can, you know, put more holes if you want them to have more, but uh, yeah, the same kind of thing. Anybody else have a feeder preference? Is uh, Matt Mertz on tonight? Is he here tonight? I haven't seen him. No. Okay. You know, we use a lot of the frame feeders too. Yeah, I think that's what he said he liked. But we have found in the spring that Smaller hives have small hive beetle in down in those, so that, but not in the fall. I don't think we've seen it, but we have seen it early in the spring, where the bees aren't getting around the small hive beetle will be hiding it. But it is a feeder that we use because we don't have enough top feeders. But I've also seen them use those and fill those with wax early in the spring. They get really excited about wax mm -hmm. building and they'll make a mess in those, but. Every feeder has a drawback, every one of them, but it's the way, so it is. So the last part of this feeding question, and my dogs are being bad, the last part of this feeding question is, when should I plan to add a candy board or hard feed to my hive? When, when is that a good idea? I'm on my meeting. I'm on my meeting. That's how we feed them in the winter. Only if you did in the Steve winter. Hey, Robert, would you mute everybody just so that I think we're getting a lot of weird feedback. Okay. Thank you. And then we'll have to unmute ourselves when we. Everyone's okay. muted. So unmute yourself when you want to speak, please. Okay. So, Steve. Musburger, try that again. I know you had something to say about candy boards or, or hard candy yeah, feed. We, as, as soon as I pull, the day that I pull supers, I put a three inch spacer. Uh, it's, it's the same size as your hive. And I put a three inch spacer on there and then I treat my bees for mites. That spacer stays on all winter because um, when I do my inspections, and I am doing my inspections all winter long, probably I don't go out there as often, but I go out once a month. <clears throat> when my bees have made it, when I open that top up and my bees are at the top of that hive, on the top of the hive body, I feed them that hard candy fondant. And I set a bowl or two of them on there and um, just keep my eye on them. So anytime in the winter time, my bees come are already up the top box, they start getting hard. I feed them hard candy. So the for you, it, it isn't a date that you choose that. It isn't a date to do that. It is when you see the bees have worked their way clear up to the top of, of your supers. Right, and if they're not up there, I carry a flashlight with me in the winter time and I look down in between the frames. Oh yeah, they're still down in there alive and there's, there's honey above them, so I'm, I don't worry about them. Good so. plan. That's just, I guess that's just my way of doing it. 
I think that's, anybody else have to contribute to that about uh, planning for using candy boards? No? I think that's uh, a good, good strategy. Well, Joe brought us an interesting question. It isn't Joe's question. It was something she saw that someone else posted and a reader was complaining that their, her bees would not draw wax. And I know Roberts talked about this a lot that pretty much after our solstice in the in middle of June, they're just kind of done. They're not gonna draw a whole lot of wax after that. And this person says, to get them to pull wax, I feed them two parts water to one part sugar. So not one to one, we're talking a very thin syrup, two parts water to one part sugar, and a dab of food grade lemongrass. And that will stimulate plant nectar that triggers their wax glands to pull wax. And the question was asked, is this gonna work? Does that really make any difference? Does anybody have any experience with food grade lemongrass in their feed or using a very, very thin feed, two parts water to one part sugar? Any thoughts on that from our expert panel? I've never, I've never heard of that. Never heard any of our professors or anything speak of that. So I'd have to say, I don't think it works, but you know. We use lemongrass when we catch swarms, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Beware of snake oil. I, I think that's, that's a, a wise choice. It, I don't know why they would think that lemongrass is the, is the thing that is going to be the trigger for them. Joe, do you have any insight on this? No, no, not at all. And that's why I'm asking because a lot of people say a lot of things that there's no scientific backing to yeah. support it. And uh, this person wasn't an academic, but, um, and the person that wrote this that had replied with that answer that suggestion uh lives over in the st louis area and um i, I just thought i never heard this no one's ever said this and it just sounds like you know it just doesn't sound right well part of it's the calendar so like they're not likely to build wax this time of year, especially after the nectar flow is over. Now I'm in the far eastern part of the state and that sounds like Douglas County and Cheryl and some other beekeepers who are over there having a boon time when sunflower fields are you know blooming and they've got wax building going on. But I really never have any wax building going on after the spring nectar flow is over. So I don't count on it. Well, I never have either, so. And I, although you need a thin syrup, I, I don't know if the two to one uh, is too watery, but you want something to mimic nectar when the nectar flow is on in the spring in order for wax stimulation. I, I don't know I, that I've ever heard anyone recommend a two parts water to one part sugar. Have you, Jolie, have you ever heard that? Okay. I'll unmute her. Okay. Now my bees like hummingbird feed when I when it's the wrong time of year. They're all over that, but and that's a. We I have never ever 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 heard of two parts water to one part sugar. Okay. Ever. Well, and that might have been, she might have misspoke and meant two parts sugar, Backwards. one part water. That's a possibility. But then adding the lemongrass and that this will stimulate a nectar for, okay, we're moving on. That's, that's well, it. The, the other thing is, is that the, pol the, the pollen that they're getting also may 
stimulate wax flow. If it doesn't have enough nutrients in the pollen that they're getting at the time, and as we get further away from spring, our pollen may lose some of its nutritional value. And so if they don't have enough of that stored up, they may not produce wax either. If they don't have pollen, they don't do much of anything. That's, that's yeah. for sure. All right, well, that's kind of ending our section on feeding. We had a lot of questions about feeding because this is the time of year that uh, if your bees don't have enough food right now, things will be pretty bleak in the winter time, but um, I'm going to go ahead on to kind of another subject area unless somebody has something to add to that. Are you going on to the refractometer question or to the... I, I to would the like to go on to the refractometer question. If that's, if nobody else has anything in feed and it said what the question was, just flat out, what is the best refractometer to purchase? And so any of our equipment people want to weigh in on that it's uh my only suggestion was to buy one from a reputable representative so that if it doesn't do what you think it should you got somebody to talk to amazon is not much help becky i would definitely agree um now the thing to really focus on is there are different kinds of refractometers out there some will measure the moisture content in honey, whereas others measure the moisture content in something that has a different viscosity than honey. Um, so, you know, definitely sourcing it from a, a reputable uh, company that sells beekeeping equipment and it's specific to beekeeping equipment versus, uh, um, you know, uh, other, uh, other uh, sources or other uh, uh, types of equipment uh, um, that are similar to a refractometer meant to measure moisture content in honey. Um, I would say that um, don't be too frugal. You know, you see them online for 20 or $30 and you're probably gonna get what you pay for. Um, on average, you know, 65, $75, you can get a nice one from several reputable companies that uh, deal with beekeeping supplies and equipment. So, uh, um, I think that uh, you don't have to break the bank on it. You don't have to buy a couple $300 unit. Um, you can spend $75 and get a nice unit that will do what you need it to do. I think the need for a refractometer is um, not, not, not underestimated. People need to have a refractometer or need to test that honey. As I don't know if you saw the, the frame that I posted online that was just looked like it could have been state fair quality. The cappings were thick. It was beautiful, just as, as good as it could be. And it measured 22. So. And yes, and I, you know, when, when we have, uh, you know, other beekeepers sign up for our bring your own supers uh, to extract at our facility, uh, the first thing we do before we even start talking about the equipment use is let's test your, you know, honey supers. And we test normally a couple frames per super just to make sure that everything's good. And um, we've had a couple dozen families or a couple dozen different beekeepers in the last three, four weeks. And I would honestly say it's ranged anywhere from the low at 16% to the high to 20, 22 and a half. Wow. Um, and I would say that 25% or just a hair less of the folks that have utilized our facility have been above 18.6. So then we you know, sit down and we discuss what their options are. You can take it home, you can de, you know, put it in a small room with a dehumidifier, draw it down, or, and, and that's gonna work the easiest, that's gonna be the method that's gonna work the fastest for you. Um, or we've had a few that have, you know, traveled far enough that they didn't want to travel back. So they had to make the decision, we're going to extract it now, but then they have to put it in a large surface area, um, you know, um, container uh, with just a few inches of, you know, honey to be able to pull the moisture down because you, you just can't pull the moisture content down in a five gallon bucket of honey with a minimal amount of surface area on top and the honey being, you know, a couple feet deep. So, you know, you know, so 
we definitely educate about that and then they can make the choice based on you know what their available time is or the distance they traveled um, but uh, you know they've been able to still draw the moisture content down if they've extracted as long as they you know follow the, the guidelines of you know putting small amounts out at a time you know with just a couple of inches of depth to be able to pull that uh, moisture to content down um, you know with no problems very good very good i think that's good advice we've talked about that a couple of different times ways to dehydrate and if you uh, have questions about that i'd check out those videos from our website so our next question is from joe last initial b and robert brought this into our attention so if robert you have something to add to it that'd be appreciated but it says it's kind of a long long lead up i have two high sorry um, he sent me a text saying that he has internet connection issues. Oh. <laughs> and to hold the question until the end, if possible. All righty. Well, we'll on. move on then. That's a small hive beetle question. And I know we have other people who wanted to talk about small hive beetles. So we'll be sure and get back to that one. I am. Uh, the next one was uh, something that, that oh. I, did you have something to add, oh. Robert? I'm sorry. I see you just came on. Cool. Back up. Hey, Joe, glad yeah. you're here. <laughs> Love the internet. Or hate the internet or whichever, <laughs> something in between. It's all good. All right. Joe says, I, do you want to just tell this? You want to tell the story? You want me to read it? Why don't you read it? Okay. <laughs> I'm I have two... frustrated with, with the internet, so <laughs> okay. I have some curse words in there and I don't want those in there. I, we'll just do a little bleep, bleep, bleep. Okay, no. I have two hives. One's a little over 15 months old and is relatively strong. The other I tried to establish this past April. I had queen problems with the first, within the first two weeks. So Robert Burns came over and found a queen, but she hasn't been too productive. He took a frame full of brood with bees on it from an older hive, placed it in the new hive. Over the summer, the stronger hive produced about 30 pounds of honey. Yay. The new hive never grew beyond one brood box, even though I put super on it in May, hoping the queen would expand into the super. She did. Okay, I checked both hives yesterday. Both were being overrun with small hive beetles, parentheses, both are in a woodsy area, and we know that that can lead to being a problem. But I have, I have had small hive beetle traps in both all summer. In the strong hive, a couple of the traps were full of beetles. And in the weak hive, there were some dead beetles in the traps, but not many compared to the many that scattered like roaches when I opened up the hive. You know, that's what your hive tool's for. Smack, smack, smack. Okay. I subsequently put four instead of two small hive beetle traps in each of the two brood boxes in the strong hive and also in the single box uh, in the weak hive. So here are the questions. Would you recommend doing anything else better to control the small hive beetle problem? Example, spray the ground around the hives. Second, since the weak hive has practically no capped brood and very little evidence of eggs, should I combine it with the strong hive? Since the small hive beetle problem seemed worse in the weak hive, is there any risk of expanding the small hive beetle problem into the strong hive if I combine the two. Joe, you are a thinking person. That is exactly the situation. And it is something that, that yes, you should not enter into this lightly, but I think you're on the right track. Let's see what the experts say. Robert, what did you advise? This is, this is, sounds like you've, it's got your fingerprints all over it. So I know earlier in the spring, we were thinking, I mean, people weren't seeing the beetles very much and they thought we were going to have a summer without them but July and August when it heats up is when the beetles come on. Um, they'll go after a strong hive as well as they will a weak hive and if, if your weak smaller hive is being overrun with the beetles I probably wouldn't recommend adding those together now merging them. Um, it's been still too warm and um, it's still too early they have a chance to take it down um, in a few weeks or um, next month in October for sure, they're, they're not going to be as destructive because they're going to be looking to keep um, warm and overwinter. 
somewhere. They don't, they don't, um, unless it's really hot and, uh, and the, um, also the sun has something to do with it too. Um, for our area there, uh, you have a lot less chance of them taking the colony down and destroying the brood and just, you know, getting into the pollen. So back to terms of, I've said this before, uh, protein. Um, as long as the beetles are kept at the edge of the peripheral of the colony and the bees are feeding it nectar or honey, they're not stimulated to lay eggs, but if they can get to the pollen, if they can get into brood, then that's going to uh, stimulate them to lay eggs. And that'd be a danger. So I'm not sure that I would consider merging them right now, but go in there. You can go in there every day. And when you pull the lid off, the bees have corralled the bees, uh, the, the beetles at the top, and you can go in there and take your hive tool and be ready to smash them and get rid of whatever you can. So Joe, um, what do you mean by overrun? I mean, when you open it up, are you seeing 10 hive beetles or are you seeing 100 hive beetles? Because There was probably 100 when I opened up that small one. I mean, they were just, they were all stacked and all of them. I opened up and they just scattered. They, they were everywhere. I, I, yeah. I'd lift a frame and there'd be, there'd be maybe 10 on a frame just in and out of the little cells and stuff. And yeah, that's not a good sign. Yeah. You may have to go in there every day. Bees haven't abscounded if they're that bad. Yeah. You may have to go in there and like I, what I've done before on a few hives and I've saved a few, when I found a whole lot of them in there, I would go and shake the bees in front of the hive, but the bees would stay on the frame and then I would shake the frame uh, on its side, hit the on the top of the lid and then all the beetles would be there and I would just start smashing away. It's and your IPM control. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are other traps. Um, there's, a, is it called a Freeman trap that's supposed to be extremely effective. It goes on the bottom, like beneath the bottom board and you could put diatomaceous earth in there or something like that, that, that beetles can get into and it will kill the beetles. Uh, the Swiffer sheets in the corners, which I've heard mixed reviews about. Some people think they're marvelous. So other trapping mechanisms, but in your case, I wonder if the expense of a Freeman trap wouldn't be justified, particularly since you're in that woodsy area kind of thing to try to to think about that, but I, I think that your caution to not combine them at this point in time is probably legitimate, except I, I do think that that weaker hive, few eggs, little brood, is probably destined to be combined, but I'd love to see you get your small hive beetle situation under control. You mentioned doing a ground drench or something like that, right. and the only thing that a ground drench will help or a ground treatment is, after they are pupating, they go into the ground. Well, after they've pupated and you've got worms all over, you probably lost your hive already because they slimed it on their way out. It, it, once they are in that pupating stage, that's nasty. Now, there are people where they have a lot of those and in your woodsy area, maybe soil nematodes or, or that guard star drench would be worthwhile and might be the thing for next year, might be that it would, would be a good mechanism. But right now, I think trying to get these beetles under control was probably your best option. Anybody else have ideas on beetles? Because honestly, yeah. we've not had many. We've not had a lot I mean, of I don't or a spider or something that yeah. the larva crawls through it, it cuts them up. What is that stuff? Diatomaceous like? earth. That's, yeah. But they, that has to be in a trap because it'll cut up bees too. It does bad things to bees. Well, I thought it soaked into the dirt and then that stuff goes into the dirt and then when the larva would crawl through it, it would cut them up. I don't know, I'd just say well, that's what I'd... But that's, that's after the fact. Right. Your hive's already gone by then. Yeah, probably. So it's not a preventive. And the beetles fly and that's how they get inside. And they winter in the cluster. So, you know, it's not like, oh, I'll make it through winter and they'll be gone. Nope, they'll be waiting for you next spring. 
So yeah, um, unfortunately, Joe's the area where his hives are are really in the woods, and there's and just there, no sunshine. There isn't any way he can pull them yeah. out in the spring into the sun or something. Right. I mean, when the leaves are off the trees, there's more sunshine over there. But um, I know that the, he's got a he's yeah. in a difficult I, terrain I have area. I'm a scholarship student that's there, and they're in the in the trees and they're got tons of hive beetles in them. It's all about location more than uh, is probably going to be the best help. Did we help you, Joe? Yes, you did. Uh, my only question then would be if I, how late can I wait to actually uh, combine the bees into the other hive? Or should I just forget about it and chalk that hive up to say, and it's going to not make it through the winter? Next month. Month. If you if things continue and you get to the point where you think it's not going to make it, and you go, nope, I'm done with it, then you choose to take the loss and shake those bees out, shake everything out of that hive and freeze that equipment. Don't leave it go like, well, we'll just wait and see and see what happens because those small hive beetle will slime in there and then it, it will be a total loss. Then it and you're freezing it to kill the eggs. Yeah, okay. you're freezing it to kill the, the eggs so that but, they don't. Or any you know, larvae. If it was me, I'd declare war on my hive beetles and I'd go in and start killing them. <laughs> That's what I would do. It's I would, quite satisfying. I would I'd go against them. I'm, I'm going to go in and start smashing them. <laughs> well, I may need some help. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all so much. I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you for the question. It was a thought provoking question and one that we all have concerns about. Thanks, Joe. You're appreciate welcome. it. Okay, moving on. The next one is kind of a, 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 a maybe answer. It's from our Facebook group and it says, Will the Northeast Kansas Beekeepers offer a beginning, offer beginning beekeeping classes this winter slash spring? Are we going to do that? And the answer is yes. How will we do that? The answer is we don't know. <laughs> so you know, we would love to be able to say that the Douglas County Fairgrounds is going to open up and that we're going to be able to offer those classes as we have in the past. But I am really fearful that we will probably be offering them as a virtual class. Um, and that doesn't mean that they won't be terrific and that you will have a lot that you can learn. It'll just be different and we'll kind of think, think that through. Anybody in our board have any thoughts on that or what, what it would where we're gonna go? No, uh, I'd say we're we're kind of in trouble without a vaccine, and I don't expect one that early. And if we did have one that early, not everybody's gonna have it. Yeah, I who will get to be vaccinated will be the next kind of thing when they get it, and I hope we do. And I think we are waiting for a vaccine, and so well, we will we do education. We will try to make that that is a priority. But whether we have a be, board meeting coming up, don't we, shortly? In October, I believe. In yeah, October so 7th, I mean, we'll have to discuss when and how and what we can do. Exactly, how we want to proceed. And so if you have strong feelings about that, the board would appreciate your input. Don't hesitate to drop us a note. Going on uh, from Facebook as well, I have a small colony that I'm trying to decide whether I should combine it with a larger colony or try to winter it over as is. What are the factors to consider when making this decision? If I combine the two colonies using the newspaper method, when should I go in and check for queen right? And how should I arrange the frames for the winter should I feed these bees during the time I'm combining them? Anybody feeling the urge to jump in on that? They're already cream white, right? They apparently are, but it's we have a small colony and a larger colony. And once you do a combine, sometimes ugly things happen, but not often. Usually that works pretty well. If I if I'm going to combine, a, a, there's a weak colony with a queen in it. She probably had issues anyway. 
a strong colony. The queen's doing what she's done. So you evaluate your queen, you got to go in and take one of them out because with my luck, with queens, is <laughs> the worst queen would win the fight. So I don't take that chance. I'm going to take the queen out. The, you got you to gotta be in control. That's it. And, I, you know, when I do the paper trip, and I, and I read this in one of, the, one of our magazines, that um, I use a little bit of sugar water, light sugar water and some lemongrass oil in it. And I'll spray the, the, uh, the colony down. I'll spray the paper down. I'll, and then I kind of spritz all the, everything and kind of help even that, that smell out with everybody. And I've been, you know, I, they've always been successful at uh, making it. So that's a We thing. have a little trouble combining with newspaper. That's, yeah. that's a good thing. So if you had a big colony and then a little colony and they both had some resources, how would you rearrange those frames? What would you do to that then? Because essentially you would probably have a three high colony at that mm -hmm. point in time. How would you, what would you go do to that colony then to get it ready for winter? Becky, what I would potentially do, I mean, you have two choices. You could, uh, you know, freeze the uh, additional frames of resources and use them uh, when needed throughout the winter on a warmer day where you can get in and do an inspection. Or you could just take that uh, box that has the resources and make it a three deep colony uh, with the thought that having combined them and giving them plenty of room, then come uh, spring, you'll be able to do a split off that and you can, uh, you know, easily do that with, uh, with the, uh, the, you know, with the design of, you know, how you've, uh, you know, laid out, uh, you know, three boxes. So you can, you can tackle it two different ways there. Typically when you set up your hive for the winter, do you try to put all the brood in the bottom? and then food over the top of that? Or do you, do you think that's an important consideration or did the bees just find it? What do you think? In the last uh, couple of days, in the last couple of weeks of doing inspections, pulling honey supers and doing mite treatments, I found brood in both boxes. Um, normally, you know, in, in the center frames um, and uh, I've normally seen three to four frames on bottom and maybe two to three on top. And they've, uh, you know, you know, stood that, you know, with, you know, kept in that, uh, you know, funneling effect or that chimney effect in the center with the resources, you know, to the outside with uh, pollen and nectar frames and then uh, uh, nectar honey frames to the outside of that. So, um, you know, I typically don't push everything to the bottom necessarily. Um, I allow the bees to manage the hive from the standpoint of where the brood is um, through, you know, the fall. And then once they've started to, you know, finish off with those winter bees uh, hatching, then, uh, then you can start, you know, feeding and they'll backfill those uh, frames with uh, your two to one syrup and, uh, that'll allow, you know, for additional reserves through the remainder of the season. They'll naturally shrink that nest size down. Yeah. I, I think the only caveat on that that I would be concerned about is that when you start moving frames around, do not separate brood this time of year. Don't, like you said, some's above, some's below, but I don't want there to be a place that the bees can't cluster around it pretty easily. So that would be about it. Okay, thanks, Chad. I, I, we agree, that's a good thing. He says, should I feed during a combine? And you can, but I don't think if they have plenty of food that's, that's really critically important, kind of decide. Next question comes from Turkey Creek Farm and it was posted September 1st. So it's been just a little bit ago. And this person wants to know, how late can I wait to pull off fall honey and rearrange honey frames for overwintering, kind of like the last question. It looks like we will have enough to extract some fall honey as well, even after leaving the bees enough. 
I don't want to pull honey for extraction until I know we have reached the end of the season and I can do it all at once. The hives are all blooming with, booming with bees. Uh, notice that there were quite a few capped drone cells in more than one hive. Is this normal for this time of year and how late into fall do I have to worry about swarming? So we have several questions there. That's a lot. That's a lot. There's a lot, lot to uh, piece out there. So starting with how late can I wait to pull off honey and rearrange honey frames for winter? Pulling off honey, I think Robert, you said it, this is typically now. This is when you wanna finish it up. Personally, so. I'm done. I'm just helping a few friends get theirs done. Yeah. Anybody <clears throat> else actively trying to produce fall honey that they're going to wait a while to pull those frames? Anybody got that going on? No. I mean, I think Judy's advice last month of September 7th, Labor Day being your target day to get your honey off get your hives and treated. to get your hives treated is like the best advice in the whole wide world that that's a whole lot more important than yeah i agree with honey. that and they they just need to need to let the bees take the rest of it it's i think it's more important that they store some honey to get them through the winter than trying to take all of it but mm -hmm. you know that's um that's a choice every beekeeper i guess makes i um i pulled mine Three weeks ago, I let them have what they want, you know, what, what the rest is out there. It's more important for me and my bees to make it through the winter so that I know that I have a colony next year. So the honey isn't all always the most important, but um, but if they're life, feed them sugar. Yeah, and I haven't heard Cheryl speak up yet tonight, but we were we were talking about that term, the Methuselah bees your long-lived bees that are gonna be born in the next few weeks, carrying the colony through the winter time because they live three, four or five months. Um, that's important. So that's the goal to get to. And to get to those bees, to have those bees be well-nourished bees, we now realize the importance of them eating honey as opposed to the sugar syrups. Correct. Those sugar syrups are emergency feed. They shouldn't be what we're relying on. We, the honey is what they, they deserve to have. So that um, making fall honey, fall was August. And so that's, you, you made your August. I would, prefer my, I would prefer my bees to be able to utilize nectar from uh, lots of floral sources. Yeah. Than to try to keep honey supers on them for extended periods of time and steal all that honey away from them and then you find yourself with a hive that is short on supplies and then you have to sit there and feed them two to one sugar and I just don't think that's as healthy for them than to naturally acquire nectar from multiple floral sources. So um, you won't find supers on my hives usually after the middle of August even. So if not even earlier, because I, I'm, I want them to, to be able to pack in plenty of food stores and, and raise those fat bees that are going to take you into the winter and get you through winter. So now, well, if, Cheryl, anyway. if Cheryl looks particularly tired tonight, she's had a <laughs> long weekend. And, and so we have to all I'm be kind to her. I'm, I'm still through I'm still through it till Wednesday, so. And my <laughs> husband's sitting over here now, and he's got the TV blaring in the background. But oh, that's okay. Happening. We're all good. All so, Cheryl, the last part of this question was about drones, and how late into the fall do I have to worry about swarming? Would you like to speak to that a little bit too? <laughs> I don't know. I've seen it all this year. Um, Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, just crazy. Um, I have. I had a colony. What date was that, Robert? Because I shot you a, because I'm, I'm going to have to go in and check that hive for Queen Wright, the parent hive. Um, I had a, a huge swarm on uh, another apiary um, that I figured was an absconding swarm, but when I took a, a quick look uh, in the tops of both colonies, they'd been treated already for mites. 
I noticed one was um, really um, weaker than it was the week before. So I went in and checked it about two days later and there was swarm cells in place, about four of them. Um, plenty of uh, plenty of places to store honey. I had brood in all stages. I can't answer. They had plenty of honey stores in the second box. She was pretty much laying in the bottom box. Um, drone brood between the boxes. I can't answer why that colony swarmed. It's not one that I want to graft from for sure. Um, but typically this time of year, and I have not fed any of my colonies at all. Um, they're still busy. I was, uh, I ran back to the house today. Um, they're crazy busy. Uh, um, and I don't even think we are aster bloom out where my, where I'm at. So I want them to go and, you know, forage for, and they're probably working sunflower and ragweed and who knows what else, but um, they're plenty busy. So I don't usually put feed to them until it gets colder uh, towards the end of maybe September. If they're even needing supplies. But, um, you don't usually find a swarm this this time of year even if you put feed to them but yeah i can't answer because i've had one myself but Thing, things have happened anyway, that are certainly unusual I, this know. time of year this we uh, caught it's a weird swarm. this year yeah we we got a call for a swarm friday night in overland park and it was a couple yeah, of and we had what? one in, uh, in uh, gardener. gardener on saturday night it was a little bit but you know if they have queens it might be something we could add to something else i don't know but it's yeah. weird but when we treat we thought we'd wait and see if they had queens but when we treat them we were going to put sticky boards down so we could see if they swarm because they have a mite infestation but you know and we that don't is, that abscounding really swarm is what we have seen more of this time of year which kind of brings into my um one of the last questions, we've got two more questions here. So we did a, sh this is from uh, Dylan. And he said, we did a sugar roll from bees on a brood frame this time. And he said, apparently they did not use a brood frame before, but he only was able to capture about a fourth of a cup of bees, but he counted 17 mites. And he says, if I remember correctly, uh, 12 per half cup is a dangerous level. Therefore, will this hive likely die out? They seemed good, except they still haven't capped anything in the last super over the last five weeks. And they were extremely angry. The frames have been, uh, the frames have drawn comb, but only a tiny amount of nectar. My thought is to go back tomorrow pull the super for good, place one packet of Apigard on the top deep and use an empty medium as a spacer, close it up. Any thoughts? Should I slap the top feeder on top also and start two to one syrup? And so, um, yeah. So I think collecting bees for your sample is tricky. Uh, I have a hard, had a hard time with that until we take the frame we want to use, make sure we don't have the queen, and we knock the bees into a cat litter bucket, and then we pour our quantity of bees into our container, and it's not hard to do at all. But, you know, everybody comes up with their own way. But a fourth a cup of bees probably didn't give you a real accurate sampling, except that you got 17 mites, which is okay. Anybody want to weigh in on this? Pull your honey and treat right away. Immediately. Yes. Yeah. Um, get that, get those, and I don't care what shape those supers are on, get them off. And now we're going to have weather in the next week that you could probably use like Might Away Quick Strips or something, or the Formic Pro. What do you think? And that you could leave a super on it, but I would, no. Yeah, but even though it says you can leave your supers on who wants to leave a honey super on with a chemical in your hive good point thank you i agree so um yeah and it is to his question is this hive dead maybe maybe not just depends how the mite load is 
and you know, and really can they get enough healthy bees in there to recover? This is, this is a weather question too. How much longer until we really have the onset of cold weather and they won't be, and it shuts down the hive. So will they be have an extended fall where they'll be able to continue to raise brood for quite some time? So at least that's my thought. I don't know. And if you use but, formic acid, you do not want to feed while you're treating with formic acid. You're right. That's one that you, you don't, you don't feed for sure. Well, and it, it, I think they need to treat and treat right away and then resample again, see what it is. And then if they have to treat it later on with uh, maybe oxalic acid or something, but they definitely need to knock that mite load down if it's 17. Exactly. Okay. And a word about resampling, don't resample the day your treatment ends give it some time, give them at least a week because most of your mites are going to hatch from your brood. That's going to tell you if there's more mites or not as bees are hatching out. That's a good, good point that I probably hadn't thought about. That's to wait just a little bit longer. Good advice, Chris. And like Judy said, if you get those supers off now and treat now, you can get two full brood cycles through which is your fat bees to make it through the world. So I think your hive still has a good chance. And the part about feeding is if you don't need to feed if your top hive body's full. You didn't say there wasn't much in there. Oh, did you say there wasn't much did you say there wasn't much nectar in there? What did he say? He said, well, it sounds like in the top super it says they seem good, except they still haven't capped anything in the last super over the last five weeks. Oh, in the super. So if his second hive body is pretty full of honey, he yeah. probably doesn't need to feed. So sometimes we use different terms for super and hive body. So that's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right. Let's see if I can get through. Do we have time for one more question? We're past eight o'clock. Has everybody gone to bed or whatever? We can do the last one. Um, this had a picture accompanying it, and the picture was of a double deep, deep nuke. And I know Cheryl has done a lot of these. I think Robert's done some of these. It says this colony, which was the double deep nuke, is a mid late June swarm that I captured, but it swarmed again mid-July. Boy, did we have that happen. They successfully requeened themselves and I've continued feeding them one-to-one -one syrup since the initial capture. They have drawn the bottom chamber and there are five frames filled with brood, but I can't seem to get them to draw much in the top. They are actively taking syrup and bringing in pollen. Would it be best if I forgo this, the nuke and transfer them to 10 frame deep equipment at this point, or should I overwinter them in double, she says double sixes, but maybe her nukes are six frame nukes. So instead of five frames, anybody, um, Cheryl, you've done a lot of nuke wintering. I like, I like the five over five. I think they can manage that a lot better than a 10 frame single deep. And I would, I'd put them in a five over five arrangement and put the, the capped honey above them. I, w I winter a lot of them that way. You, you got to watch them early, you know, in the spring, um, you may have to, to, to feed a little bit if, if they, their stores get short, but I, I don't usually have much problem with that. Um, you know, a little syrup maybe late, February, March, if they need it, but I, I just find that they can regulate um, their temperatures and stuff. It seems like so much better with the five over five. Do you think that, Robert, too? Yes, <clears throat> and if they've the, got the comb, drawn comb in deep. both boxes. Right. If they don't have any right. drawn comb in the upper box, yeah. then plan on removing no. it. No. Yeah, then just get rid of it. That would be no. it. Very good. Robert, I am not looking at the chat questions because of having messed up my video feed. Were there any questions that we needed to address? There were a full. Um, 
Uh, one of them said we're looking for some criteria for when to begin fall feeding. I think you may have answered that and not directly to that question, but. Well, and that the other thing is, is our meeting this month is with Christy. Yay, Chris. She's gonna be, she's gonna be doing, um, preparing your hives for winter. So we're gonna cover, Christy's gonna cover all kinds of things, right, Christy? Yep. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So someone asked about leaving a super on over the winter. You know, should they leave their super on over their winter? And, and you're so thinking they need a honey some, super. No, yeah, I think in that question, it was Mika who's on here. And she wrote that in and she wanted to know about leaving her honey super on. It was Well, if you do, you have to pull your queen excluder, right? Correct. That, I mean, that's what I, I mean, because they could leave the queen behind if they went all the way up. So you the bees prefer to overwinter on brood comb. And if you're, yeah. if it's a brand new super and you've got a queen excluder, potentially you're going to kill your hive because if the bees eat the honey all the way up into the super, they're going to leave the queen behind. Yeah. And if you take that queen excluder out, and go, no, I want my bees to have this. So they worked up in the hive in the winter and then they ended up in the spring up in that super eating that honey. Guess where your queen started laying eggs next spring? So that honey super is now a brood super. And we hate that. Yeah. I don't want brood. Yeah. I, don't I tell like everybody, you know, that's what we do this for. To, we like our honey, we like, we like the honey. So take, take the extra and leave the rest for them. That's why we pull supers a little bit earlier and then they can have whatever else is left out there. So, you know, you're, you know, I know they're caring about their bees and we all appreciate that, but it's okay to pull your super and extract it. That's not, you know, and. And the, and the real problem is, is that the cocoons that are left behind from the brood are going to be a lot more attractive to small uh, to um, uh, wax moth when you take those off eventually in the future. So when you use those, that dark comb, if it gets darker and used quite a bit for brood, is going to be a problem. It's harder to extract and it's more attractive to the predators. So you got lose lose there. That's for exactly. sure. Exactly. I yeah we we don't do that now. I understand that if you have a super that just had a little bit of activity in it, extracting it doesn't seem like it's worth the effort. And what do you do with this over the winter? Well, the, the best answer is to freeze it and to keep it in your freezer until the weather outside is cold enough that you can just leave it in a frozen, in a room that does isn't heated and do that. So, so I understand the storage problem and that leaving it on the hive seems like the best answer, but it really isn't. What do you think, Jolie? Did we answer it? Yes, well, you I could also it. try putting it above your inner cover and maybe the bees will pull the honey out of it and move it down into the brood box because you've created a barrier. That's true. That's a good idea. That would be to get them to then put that more of that into the brood area. Chris, you know stuff. Sometimes. <laughs> Guys, thanks for tuning in tonight. Do we have any other announcements for the group? Because we are past eight o'clock by a considerable margin. I appreciate you tuning in. How many people did we have here with us tonight, Robert? Um, I saw a peak of 54, I believe. Well, that's good. That's good. I hope we're at you got 48 right now. Thanks for tuning in. And I, I think we're done for the evening. Great. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Good night.